All right, so we're at a session called Using Metrics to Measure and Understand Your AWS Environment Performance. Really long title. Uh, basically, the gist of this is I want to make sure you've got all the information you need to be able to start working with metrics and understand monitoring, especially in an AWS environment. Uh, my name is Matt Williams. I'm the evangelist at Datadog. Now, just kind of curious, uh, show of hands, how many of you actually have heard of Datadog or awesome, awesome? How many are you of using Datadog? Okay, okay that's okay. Um, you will be soon. Uh, so if you want to reach me, I'm mattw at datadoghq.com. I think mattw at datadog.com also works, but uh, and we're at datadoghq.com or datadog.com. I'm not sure why we threw that HQ on there. Um, and uh, on Twitter, I'm a techno evangelist, um, which is pretty cool to have for an evangelist. Um, out of the people here, OK, so you told me that uh, you've heard of uh, Datadog. Um, how many of you are, uh, let's see, how many instances do most of you have? Let's say, do you have uh, more than, let's go with 50. 50 instances on, great, cool, okay. Uh, how about more than 100? Okay, more than 1,000? Cool, cool. Uh, all right, kind of nice to know. Um, in this session, we're gonna talk about six main things. I got a little bit of an intro, uh, kind of why are we dealing with this. A little bit of who. Um, I, I, we talk to, I talk to a lot of customers, and so this presentation comes from information I collected from a lot of those customers about uh, what they're doing, how they're monitoring uh, their AWS environment. We'll talk a little bit about why and, uh, and how you're gonna deal with the issues that you need to deal with. And, and then, then finally, you know, what? What kind of stuff do we need to monitor? And, and then finally, details. Uh, the actual details of uh, you know, which metrics do we recommend you look at at a very minimum. Now, whenever we talk about you know, specific metrics, it's hard to recommend, okay, you need to look at these three things and nothing else. Because there's far more than three things that you need to look at, or five things, or 50 things. It depends on your environment. And so one thing that I'm going to be mentioning a few times uh, throughout this session is that there's no way to come up with a specific set of recommendations because it depends on your business, your environment, your goals. Um, and so you can't just rely on what you see in a presentation or a book or a blog post or a website, you need to put a little bit more thought into what's required. So let's talk a little bit intro. Now before I get started, before I get too far into this, I wanna let you know that getting started with monitoring on AWS or whatever the platform happens to be was pretty easy. If we, at Datadog, we make it really easy uh, to do. You know, Datadog is a, a SaaS-based monitoring platform, and we've got these agents that you're gonna be running on each of your hosts, and we try to make it super, super easy to get those hosts up and running, to get those agents up and running. So getting started is easy. Getting good, that's not so easy. It takes time. It takes time to understand what your environment looks like, uh, what is normal, you know, a, a normal, for me and uh, for, my, for the environment that runs Datadog is gonna be very different than what normal looks like for you. And it's not exactly quick. You know, the, the, well, we're gonna display the, the metrics really quickly, but for you to understand what is good and what's bad, for you to understand what's normal, it takes a long time. It takes, you know, whatever the cycles are in your business, you know, if you're, uh, um, you're, you kind of cycle through uh, big bursts at the end of the month, it's probably gonna take a, a couple of months to figure out what is normal. If we're looking at more like every day, then it's gonna take at least a few days to figure it out. But there's always these cycles. That it's gonna take a long time to come up with a normal. And it's okay to come up with a normal today and then come up with another normal tomorrow. And you know, as you progress, get better and better, get closer and closer to what normal should be. And the reason why I keep talking about what is normal is that we want to eventually come up with some alerts that help you um, 
uh, get alerted to when there is a problem. In order to be alerted when there's a problem, you need to know what normal is. And so we're a monitoring company. And one of our customers uh, who has actually mentioned, I think they were mentioned this morning, a company called AdRoll, um, a guy who works there at Brian Troutwine, uh, he talked about, uh, in a lot of his presentation, he talks about monitoring has three parts. And I thought it was really great, a great way of explaining it. The three parts of visualization, alerting, and analysis. And basically, each one of those things break down. So a visualization tells you how things look, but not why. If you look at enough of the visualizations, maybe you can figure out the why. But on its, on the, the, on its own, a visualization is not really going to tell you why. It's going to show you stuff, make it look pretty. We try to make it look pretty. And um, try to give you a lot of information in a condensed area so you can see, yeah, see how things look, but again, not necessarily why. Alerting tells you is that something, one particular thing happened. It went over a certain threshold. It uh, went below a certain threshold. It, uh, there was a sudden change, but it's not going to tell you why. It's going to tell you something happened, but not why. It's the analysis that tells you why, but only if you know how to ask for what. So those three things kind of com combine to, uh, uh, to make up what we think of as monitoring. Now, notice I didn't talk about uh, actually doing anything to fix the problem. It's a little bit out of the scope of monitoring. Uh, we're a monitoring company, and we are, you know, we've got 100 plus integrations to help make it really easy to monitor whatever your environment looks like, whether it's uh, AWS, and on top of AWS, you've got Postgres or Redis or Cassandra or Nginx, Apache, whatever that happens to be, we're going to try to make it as easy as possible to do this, uh, the, the, the monitoring, all the three steps of monitoring. And so who did I collect some of this information from? For, for this specific presentation, I looked at three main customers, and of course, us. I mean, we're a we're user of Datadog. Um, and so I talked to uh, the guys at AdRoll. Um, and uh, AdRoll's, uh, I guess, I heard that they were mentioned this morning as a case study. Uh, Real-time ad bidding, <laughs> they do two million transactions per second, uh, two million bids, uh, incredible amount of stuff that they're having to process through their systems. Another one that I don't know if you, maybe you haven't heard of, is called Team Internet. Um, and they've also got a part of their business called DNTX. And they're in the business of domain parking. Um, and when I first heard that, I thought, oh, that doesn't sound like ethical stuff. Uh, no, well, you know, you're buying a bunch of domains and sitting on it for a long time. And, um, but what was really interesting was this park domain traffic exchange. I'd never heard of such a thing. Um, and the idea there is that you buy some domain, uh, my favorite monitoringtools.com. And uh, I don't have something to put on that site. I, I haven't uh, invested the time to uh, build out the site. I can sell the traffic of people who visit that site and sell it on this exchange. And then other people who want to get traffic who are of people who happen to be choosing that domain, you know, my favorite monitoring, I already forgot my domain name, uh, they can uh, buy that traffic. And so the person visits the site or visits that domain and within some hundredths of a second, they get redirected to your, your uh, website because you've purchased that uh, traffic on uh, DNTX. And they deal with, you know, for the park domains uh, or domain parking sites in the world, they handle about 95% of the traffic goes through them. Pretty cool stuff. And another customer I talked to was uh, Simple Reach. Simple Reach is all about content measurement. And so a company like a, a big uh, uh, publisher, um, they produce all sorts of content every day. And they want to try to understand what are the best articles? What's the best article that they need to really push up to the top? It's not just about page views, because there's also social media involved, and which are the things that are being shared the most. And they're trying to make about 7 billion measurements per day um, and uh, uh, to, to make sure that you know, the best contents rise, rises up to the top. So pretty neat stuff that they're doing as well. And each one of them have different requirements uh, in AWS and different requirements of a monitoring solution. 
Um, and finally, I, you know, of course, I work with Datadog, so I was able to talk to some of the people that manage uh, Datadog internally, and that what, you know, what are the most important metrics that people should deal with. Okay, so that's a little bit about who. Uh, who helped me build out this session? So let's talk about why. So why do you want to measure? Why is it important to measure? Why is it, uh, why are you here? Why is, why, why is this stuff important? In order to improve, you gotta know where you came from. Um, so you need to understand what was performance like yesterday or last week or last month. You need to know this stuff so that you can go forward and make sure you're always better or at least the same. So see where you came from, see where, how you're doing right now, especially compared to where you were yesterday, or where you were last month. You wanna understand those, uh, that difference. And then see how you can improve. So I mean, just uh, seeing that uh, you're doing better than you were before is nice, but you wanna see how you can improve on what you were doing. Um, so you wanna have, be able to come up with experiments that uh, test and uh, come up with new ways of doing things faster, doing things better. And by having a bunch of measurements, a bunch of uh, uh, metrics that have been recording every, every day, every, well, we record it every second, and we keep that data for a year. So by doing that and trying out a few experiments, you're gonna be able to see whether things have improved, and you're gonna be able to see whether things don't improve. This was the, one of the main things that the guys at um, uh, well, both AdRoll and, um, uh, yeah, AdRoll which we're talking about, they will roll out, uh, you know, 10% of, you know, if they come up with an improvement to some portion of their business, um, they'll roll out maybe 10% of the servers, you know, like what uh, Netflix will do and a few other companies. And they'll roll it out, and then they've got a dashboard on Datadog that looks at the existing machines, you know, the 90% of machines that are already out there, and then the 10% of machines that have been updated, and look at the exact same metrics. Has performance improved, or is it a little bit slower? When you work with Datadog, uh, the dashboards, you can also say, you know, maybe I have one line that represents some sort of performance metric uh, for all my old machines. Create another line on that same chart that just looks at a different tag, uh, and that tag could be new version or new boxes or something like that. And so the reason you measure is to be able to see where you came from, what are you doing now, and how can you improve? So, okay, that's easy. Uh, anybody can do that. But what makes this complicated is the fact that we've got this idea of elasticity. Elasticity is what makes this really, really complicated. And that's become the new normal. You know, if I, uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Uh, typically you had uh, you have five boxes, 10 boxes, 100 boxes, whatever they happen to be in your server room. And the ones that you had in your server room one day happened to be exactly the same number of machines you had the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day. But today, you know, so, and more recently, um, the number of instances is, is fluctuating a little bit more. So instances could have a lifetime of maybe uh, days or weeks or months, but now we're seeing more things like Docker and other container um, pieces. And uh, these containers have lifetimes much shorter. Uh, one of the other companies that we uh, work with um, does uh, uh, kind of amateur sports scores. And uh, you know, this is recording kind of sports statistics for your kids' baseball game and including play-by-play, play, play, what's going on. Um, and uh, you know, the, there's a scorekeeper and they can say, okay, little boy Jimmy went to first base, click. And all this play-by-play uh, play data is stored up on, on their server, well, on AWS. But the number of games that happen during the week is pretty minimal. They need just a few instances going on. But on the weekend, the number of games that they're tracking is something around 50 to 60,000 games that they're tracking. And of course, with each game, there are X number of players on, the, on the, each team and all these different plays that happen, and there's this enormous amount of data. And so if, to go from zero to 30,000 games per day, uh, they need to scale up uh, incredibly. And so this 
Elasticity is what kind of makes this a lot more complicated because they can't rely on just a few machine names in your monitoring. You need to come up with a different way to help monitor and manage large groups of machines. And these groups of machines are changing all the time. So just some scenarios that require elasticity. You know, amateur sports, that was a, a pretty interesting story uh, when I talked to those guys. Uh, shopping events, concerts, marketing campaigns. Um, that's definitely something that uh, AdRoll deals with and uh, a few others. Okay, so it's a little bit about why. So how? One of the ways that we try to manage that complexity is through the idea of tags. And so I got a few screenshots here um, of tags that you're probably familiar with. So the one on the top left is my Gmail uh, mailbox. And Gmail uses tags, they call it labels. But uh, for each message, I can assign it several labels. In this case, I've uh, assigned it a label of support and a label of dev. Uh, and so if I click on the dev, uh, what looks like a folder, I'll see all my dev-related messages. And if I click on support, I'll see all my support-related messages. Except they're really just tags. They're not really folders, they're tags. Over on the right side, you got your EC2 console, or uh, AWS console. And here I've got uh, um, a list of machines. I'm only showing the top one. But each of those machines, I've assigned a tag. And uh, some of the tags that are uh, available, name is a tag. Uh, and then I've created another one called demo tag, and I've called it, uh, given as a value of mat demo. And the idea there being, I, we create a bunch of demo instances and assign different values to that tag, mat demo, Chad demo, different demos, depending on who's running that particular demo. And down on the bottom, I've got uh, my uh, Mac OS X uh, Finder. And uh, for any, you know, and Finder or Mac um, operating system, as well as Windows, has supported the idea of tagging on files for a long time. OK, Mac not so long, but Windows for a really long time, uh, tagging per file. So tags makes this easier, and we found this in Datadog as well. And so this happens to be our host map. And in the host map, we can see our infrastructure. Uh, we're looking at the part of Datadog that's on US East. And I'm looking at US East 1A, 1B, and 1E. And I can start breaking this down, finding different parts that interest me based on tags. And so I'll go ahead and do that right now. Uh, let's see, I want to look by image. And so now I've broken this down to US East 1A, 1B, and 1E. And inside that, what images, what uh, source AMI file, or AMIs are being used for each one of these hosts. Each one of these hexagons is a host. So I can zoom on on one of these availability zones. And at this point, hmm, OK, so it looks interesting. And using a tool like this, I can see maybe I've got two different versions of the same image. Um, somebody has come up with the, the next version that upgrades a few pieces of software inside it. And I can see side by side different versions of that same thing and see, oh, well, looks like the newer version, all my uh, instances are slower for some reason. But the only difference seems to be that AMI. And so maybe that's an AMI we should probably avoid. I could also group this by anything else that has a tag. So a role. We have roles associated with all of our instances. We have um, the kernel that's associated with that instance, or location, or other all sorts of other things. Let's go with role. And I'll zoom in on one of these um, sections. And you know, maybe even uh, I'll look at instance type. So now looking at uh, down to the, you know, it's a C3 2x large, R3x large, uh, and keep zooming in to find, you know, just the groups of machines. And so I didn't have to um, find, you know, I, I'm looking for this particular instance name. Of course, nobody remembers what these instance names are. So you need to find some other way of finding which machines you care about right now. You want to learn about all the R3x larges that happen to be in uh, using that particular role and using that particular image, here's a great way of finding that data very quickly. And that's what we're using this uh, host map for. Okay, so that's pretty cool. 
Tags also allow for kind of an ad hoc aggregation, ad hoc query. In this case, I got an example of uh, something you might look for uh, when having to manage, uh, in this case, Docker containers. So you might have a query that says something like, you want to monitor all the Docker containers that are happen to be running the image web in region US West 2 across all the availability zones and uh, make sure that resident set size is less than a gigabyte on instance types that are C3 XL or extra large. And so if I apply the different, what would probably be tags in this, I can do that with a bolding. And so I've got uh, image web. Web is one of my tags. I, so I would sign a, an image tag of web, um, a region tag of US West 2, um, an availability zone tag. In, in this case, I'm looking at all of them. And an instance type tag of C3XL. OK, so that, that makes this uh, query a little bit easier to deal with. I don't have to do a query that's looking for specific machines. I don't have to do you know, complicated list and group management. I just have these tags that I can look at. And then I can just change the, the, the key query in the middle, which is that resident set size is less than a gig. So I could easily set, change it to a resident set size is greater than I don't know, one and a half times the average of all the resident set size across all the um, web images on C3XL and US West 2 and across all availability zones. So tags makes this really, really cool, really easy to deal with, really easy to manage what could be, I mean, this could be all Docker containers. And we're seeing customers that have tens of thousands of Docker containers across hundreds of instances on, on AWS. Dealing with tens of thousands of names of containers is really difficult. Dealing with a few tags, that's a lot easier. So what about context? Here I'm looking at, uh, this happens to be just one of the dashboards that uh, we provide uh, for looking at Postgres. And this is looking at some two-day period of time back in March. And one thing we try to do is provide context. You, you want to, just seeing a metric on its own doesn't really tell you a whole lot about what's going on. You need to get context to be able to understand the full story. And so one of the ways we provide context is by having a lot of dashboards on the same page. Now, these are probably, they can be a little bit smaller than you might actually use, um, just to fit them all on this screen, that 1280 by 720. But you get the idea. And if you have a much bigger monitor, you can have much bigger graphs. Um, but at least I can get a little bit more context about what's going on right here. And uh, oh, before you think, wait, none of the labels make any sense at the bottom, that's intentional. This is actual you know, real data from us, and so I've got a little uh, tamper monkey script that just runs and says, change all the fonts to something that's not readable by any of you in the audience. So it doesn't normally look like that. But um, as I drag my mouse along, I've seen this vertical bar that shows me what's going on across all the other graphs that I'm looking at, and that provides a little bit more context about what's going on in this environment. And if I want to add a little bit more context, I can say, well, maybe sources, um, I want to pull stuff from GitHub. And so now I'm looking at issues and pull requests and other types of information that come from GitHub overlaid on top of uh, all of my dash uh, graphs. And I don't know if you can see this, but there's this little vertical um, line kind of moving along as I drag this over. I see the particular um, uh, issue. In this case, it's a pull request. So it gives me a little bit more context about what's going on. And so I can eat now, if I, because I'm using tags, and because I'm using um, other sources of context, I'm able to get a much better idea of what's, what actually caused a problem. What actually, you know, if there's a huge spike in something, um, what caused it? Being able to find different ways of looking around your environment to understand that context becomes really important. And tags are something that allow us to do this. So in this case, the tag is sources, and the value is GitHub. OK, so what? So what metrics do you need to look at? So this is the hard part. You know, understanding why you need to do that, that's easy. What metrics do you need to look at? That's a lot harder, because there's not really one source of expertise. 
we're trying to become you know, one of those sources of expertise. We're starting to build out uh, more and more blogs about what kind of metrics you need to monitor, but there's not one place you can go to that is just the right information for you. And this is, again, the hard part. But there is a lot of guidance, a lot of books you can grab. Uh, we happen to li really like the systems performance book from Brendan Gregg. Uh, not so much because it recommends specific metrics to look at, but it recommends a, a way of looking at metrics, a way of looking at metrics in general, a way of classifying metrics. I really like this uh, effect of monitoring and alerting. Um, and again, not because it's recommending specific metrics to look at, but because it's looking at patterns and how to analyze the, the dashboards that you're looking at, how to read and how to identify anomalies and what are anomalies. And then I added some random system, sysadmin book. I'm not saying I recommend this one. It just happens to be, you know, choose your, choose your flavor dot system administration book. Um, and so there's a lot of this book, you know, books online or books available um, or blog posts or websites that talk about, oh, here are the five metrics. You can visit the datadog.com or datadoghq.com website and go to our blog. We've got several posts that say, here are the five metrics to look at. There are five metrics that are important, but they're not necessarily the five metrics that you need to look at because your business is different. And I wish there was an easy way, but usually the best way is to find, hire, or train some sort of expert in your environment. Somebody who understands your, what, what your needs are, what your goals are, what, your, what is good for you. you know, is it uh, that customers have a, you know, don't experience any delay in adding something to a shopping cart? Or is it um, that they don't, we don't ever lose a transaction, or you know, what's, the most, what's the key bit of information? What's the key metric that's super important? And how do you translate that back to maybe AWS EC2, or to Postgres, or to Redis, or to whatever the, the applications we're dealing with are? So this is, yeah, the hard part, trying to figure out the context, because your context changes the meaning of the metrics that you're recording. And so the Brendan Gregg book talks about three categories of metrics. There's utilization. Utilization is percent over time. So CPU utilization or uh, disk utilization or whatever other kind of resource utiliz utilization. There's saturation. Saturation is looking at wait queue length. So the, the, how long is a queue before it goes to whatever is utilizing, whatever is, is processing stuff? So that queue length. Um, is talking about saturation, because if that queue starts growing, obviously your resource is, is overly saturated. And then there's errors, just an error count. How many, thing, how many bad things happened in X period of time? And so, okay, that didn't show up too well. Um, but uh, so to help understand what is good and what is bad and what are the metrics gonna look like, it kinda helps to look at some patterns. What are some patterns that you're typically going to see within your dashboards? And so I've got a bunch of these patterns that I grabbed mostly from Datadog uh, dashboards. Um, and I've kind of removed the scales, um, although the scales are super important. Because I think with pretty much any one of these patterns, you can see the same pattern and the same metric just if you zoom in or zoom out uh, enough. But try to think about this at the whatever the normal level is. And so we might have the spiky pattern, which is, um, you know, you've got a lot of bursts um, up in, in value. Um, and this might be uh, CPU utilization on something that's on a machine that's really busy all the time, and it's constantly spiking up, and then stopping for maybe a second, and then spiking up again. There's kind of this more steady view, where things tend to stay about the same. Maybe it's because the machine's not properly utilized. May, might be a low, really low steady value, or it might be a really high steady value, in which case it's probably utilized pretty well. There's a counter. The idea of a counter is constantly rising. You know, it could be errors. Number of, uh, number of times somebody viewed the page in a day, and that constantly goes up. Uh, number of errors that you experience for uh, some plugin on your system, it constantly goes up until you reset that value. There's kind of the bursty pattern where things tend to stay around 
a low value or maybe a really high value and, and all of a sudden spike up um, or spike down. And it's kind of this bursty pattern where things generally are around, the, around you know, a normal level and then spike up, spike up every now and then. This is a binary idea. Uh, so this is, this is not exactly a binary view, but the idea being kind of an on-off. Uh, maybe it's a container that comes on and then it dies. And then it comes on for 30 seconds or 10 minutes and then it shuts down. And so that's the idea of a, a kind of a binary view. There's also the classic sawtooth. We see this across all sorts of dashboards all the time. The idea being maybe it's a, um, the cache is being loaded up um, and, uh, uh, or a queue is being loaded up and it's constantly got more and more items on, in the queue and all of a sudden whatever's processing it just has this burst of activity and the queue drops or the cache is flushed or you know, something is that value drops down to nothing. So we see Sawtooth all the time in, in a lot of graphs. And then there's the idea of cyclic graphs. Uh, and here where we've got some sort of pattern that keeps happening over and over and over again. And this could be every day. Maybe this is uh, looking at two days and the trough is in the morning before anybody wakes up and the peak is maybe at lunchtime and the trough again at lunch, at, in the nighttime. You know, it could be that, or it could be some other interval. Of course, I didn't show you the scale. So it's kind of hard to know what exactly that is. That was intentional. And then there's a kind of a starey, starey view. That's not a word, but you get the idea. Um, maybe uh, if this were going up, um, so kind of a stairs going up, maybe it's number of connections to a particular database. And you uh, spike up to a little, some, some value, stay at that value for a while, and then all of a sudden need a bunch more connections and you open up a, a bunch more connections, and then you kind of, kind of ch go along, chug along at that level, and then grab another bunch of connections. In this case, it's kind of going down, it's then steady, 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 and then down. And we see that kind of pattern, not quite as much. Again, that sawtooth we see all the time. And once you've looked at some of these patterns, then you start looking around for anomalies. And so this happens to be uh, this looks like it's average of CPU stolen over instant size um, over a long, long period of time. And if this were a really short period of time, maybe those anomalies would be really important to know, to, to see, oh, oh, there's this anomaly right here. Is that bad? Is that good? Or is it just not important? This happens to be one spike of not really that much over the course of 12 months probably not all that important, not important for me to, to focus on, unless, of course, it's December 30th and it just happened just now, in which case I probably do want to know about that. I probably want to try to deal with that and try to see if this is a problem across other machines. And of course, because I've got these tags assigned to all my different uh, uh, metrics and hosts and instances, I can use this to understand where, what else is being affected by this particular spike. So are the anomalies the focus, or should they be actually ignored? And it depends on your environment, depends on what you're looking at, depends on so many things. So you want to figure out your cycles. Here I'm looking at uh, one of our integrations is with Desk. Uh, we used uh, desk.com for tech support. And here we can see the kind of the fluctuations through the day, and this is looking at four days of activity. And um, so in the morning, things are pretty quiet. Customers aren't bringing in any tickets. And then somewhere, you know, maybe it's 8 o'clock, maybe it's 10 o'clock. Okay, we don't wake up till, no, it's around 10 o'clock. Things spike up. And then around lunchtime, everybody is fine. They want to eat lunch. And then it spikes up again around in the afternoon. And then it dies off towards the evening, and fewer people are uh, uh, issuing any tickets in the evenings. And then it, you know, kind of uh, does that same pattern again. And then... People go in home for the, for the night. I don't know what happened on this fourth day. Uh, obviously, something not so good, but because uh, we had a lot of tickets then. But, you know, the, so maybe we see the pattern that happens. We see that uh, uh, maybe the mornings tend to be pretty low and the e afternoons tend to be pretty high. But that last day, obviously, something big happened. And so it would probably be a really good idea to have an alert based on a value closer to here 
but you wouldn't know that unless you had figured out your cycles. You wouldn't know what normal is. You might think normal is, if you start looking you know, somewhere around here, you might think normal is right here. It's not until you understand those patterns of what happens each day that you know, okay, that's actually not so bad. It's this stuff that's bad. Here I'm looking at a month of CloudTrail, uh, CloudTrail-related uh, metrics. And uh, I happen to see that this is about a month. I can see there's one week, two week, three, four, okay, five, eh, two halves. So four weeks of, of CloudTrail data, and you've got like these five fingers of spikes. Um, and each of those fingers represents a different day of the week and not as much CloudTrail-related activity happening on the weekends for this particular host. And so understanding what a pattern, you know, understanding the pattern, understanding the cycles helps me know where to set the alert thresholds. I throw this one in, kind of fits, just getting the scales right. Sometimes it's easy to get, put two metrics on the same dashboard that don't really relate to each other, don't really fit on the same scale. And so you might have you know, some value that stays around zero and then some other value that stays around 80 or 800 or 8 million, but it's because the scales just aren't right. You want to get the scales right or um, uh, just so that things t you can compare things more accurately. Combining sca time scales. In this case, I'm looking at Docker. Uh, this comes from uh, one of the customers. Uh, looking at Docker for some period of time um, and being able to look at Docker per, uh, performance per hour, per day, per month. In this case, they weren't using it for that long in the month. But uh, understanding how these different scales fit together help you to identify the different patterns that you might see. Here's another example of uh, these, these patterns that you see in days. So this is ZFS logical reads. I'm not sure what software this is coming from, but um, I'm looking at uh, uh, it kind of spikes up around 8 o'clock in the morning, a little trough around lunch, and then dies off towards the end of the day. Looking at a week of data, we see that kind of spikes every day, and then looking at a month of data, we see you know, there's five fingers of, of, of spikiness, and then two days kind of in the trough on the weekends. So it helps to kind of combine different scales, to combine different values to help find the patterns. In this case, I'm looking at uh, one particular metric, um, and I've done a, one of the functions in, in Datadog is the idea of time shift, and so you can time shift uh, things down back a day or back a month, and that way I can look at one chart that shows me information from multiple days, multiple weeks, whatever I want to do using that magical time shift uh, function. Okay, so details. That's enough of the kind of generalities. Let's talk about some actual details, actual metrics that uh, you know, these customers as well as Datadog has found to be really important. And again, I'm going to say it's impossible to come up with what are the best metrics to you because your environment's different. Your, what's important to Datadog, what's important to AdRoll, what's important to Simple Reach is different than what's important to you and your environment. So it all depends on your workload. On Amazon uh, AWS EC2, uh, we're, we often think it's a great idea, especially uh, this was, um, who was it? Uh, I think it was the guys at AdRoll. Uh, actually, no, it was the guys at Team Internet. Um, often they'll have uh, instances that they bring up, and uh, they tend to be, you know, most of the instances that they bring up are fine, but every now and then there's one or two that show up, or that they bring up, and they see CPU stolen goes kind of wacky. And th th this, this, any VM that lo gets loaded up on one particular host um, happens to have a really high CPU stolen rate. And when you look at it combined with CPU idle, you can see there's this uh, correlation between the two. And, um, and what they do is once they identify that in Datadog, once they see that that is happening, they quickly just kill that instance and bring it up again. And chances are they're on a different box and everything's fine again. And so it's just one of those things that they look for every time they bring up one machine or a set of instances is look at that CPU stolen and uh, especially alert on it. And uh, if they see that alert come up, then they know, okay, let's, let's shut it down, bring it up again, and we should be good. 
system load norm, uh, norm five, uh, the idea is system load normalized over five minutes, um, is a great way of understanding that, plus the memory percent usable and disk percent usable, is a great way of understanding, is the instance type that you're using big enough or too big? And these types of measurements help you see, well, okay, this one, obviously, I need to uh, upgrade to the next, size, next in instance type size. Another one is uh, AWS EC2 and network in and out, and disk read and write ops. So one thing that's different between these metrics is that the system CPU, well, all the system-related metrics um, are things that are running in the agent. Uh, the agent is uh, polling the actual machine, or the, the, the host, the, the, the operating system for these values. But the AWS EC2 metrics are coming from CloudWatch. Um, CloudWatch is being updated, depends on how much you're paying, but being updated one minute every minute or every five minutes, whereas the metrics that we're looking at um, in the agent are being updated every second. Um, so that doesn't mean you should rule out the EC2 uh, metrics, but just use them in context of all the other things that you're collecting to be able to get a full picture of what's going on. Because there are some things that you know, the, the CloudWatch metrics are, are looking at that we can't measure um, any other way. So you definitely need to look at those things, but uh, combine them with the metrics that you're collecting using our agent or whatever tools you're using. So in this case, I'm looking at CPU stolen. Um, and I can scroll down and see that same uh, CPU idle. Nothing really special here. It's not until I uh, go back sometime. Let's select a range and go back a bunch of months. And then also update the instant size. M3 medium had the issue. And that should update. And so that's where I saw that spike in sometime around towards the end of December. There's also one around uh, March. And actually, uh, in this case, in both of these cases, there happened to be a uh, message uh, in the uh, AWS logs saying, hey, um, there was this issue we experienced. It's all fixed now. Don't worry about it. But we happened to notice the problem just before we got that log message. Oops. Anything else on there? Nope. Here I'm looking at some of those uh, system load norm, uh, normalized uh, over five minutes over all my machines. One thing I can do here is uh, I'm going to change this up a bit and take a look at uh, uh, grouping this by host, I think, or maybe by image. Uh, and this way, I'm going to see multiple lines. I'm going to display them as lines and not areas so I can see them better. and save this out. Oh, I can't get down to the OK button. Well, that sucks. Um, my screen's too small. OK, well, the idea here is that I, now I'm grouping them by image, and I see one line for every image type that I'm using inside of on AWS. And that way, I can see very quickly, for this particular metric, this guy, image. Uh, AMI CC 5229A4 and 44E is a little bit different. It is performing not quite as well. Of course, the scale is one, two out of, I think, 100. Um, so maybe it's not that big a deal. But if the uh, scales were a little bit different, I'd be able to see very easily, oh, OK, this particular image, hmm, maybe I need to investigate what's going on with that image. What's, What's the role on that image? Are there, is there a role that's all across multiple images, in which case maybe this is the wrong image to use in this particular role? I'll close out of that and move on. When you're dealing with provision IOPS, um, uh, EBS, one of the things to look at is um, AWS EBS volume queue length. And it should never be over one. You know, it, one is where it should be. Uh, of course, we're dealing with times that are, you know, updated every minute or every five minutes um, or so. And so across, the, across a minute, it should never be more than one. Um, and in this case, we have a bunch of spikes that, where it spikes up to five, ten, um, five or ten. 
And every time it does that, we happen to have this kind of correlated uh, CPU IO weight that happens right around the same time. And just by looking at that EBS volume queue length, we can see this kind of pattern. And if we were just looking at CPU IO weight, maybe we wouldn't identify that as a problem. Um, so EBS volume queue length is one of those really useful ones to look at to get a better idea of what's going on. Elastic load balancer, um, some of the metrics that we think are really important, healthy, house, healthy host count and latency. So you, the idea is you want to keep enough hosts to, to try to keep that latency low. Um, HTTP code ELB 500. Um, and with enough hosts, this is going to pretty much stay around zero. So that's good. Surge queue length. So as the number of inbound requests um, becomes too much, we're going to see this surge queue length go over a certain value, uh, go, increase in size. Um, and uh, this usually happens as you don't have enough um, healthy hosts to be able to deal with that. And then there's the backend connection errors. There's uh, um, the backend connection errors for each of the kind of classes of HTTP errors, 500s, 400s, 300s. So actually, I have an example of that, I think. Um, so here I'm looking at uh, host healthy, host, healthy host count uh, and EW, ELB latency. And so ELB latency is right pegged at zero. Um, healthy host, God, I have a hard time saying that every single time. Healthy host count um, is, is good. I mean, we're, we've got enough hosts to deal with this load. And the uh, HTTP co um, 500 over across all my ELB hosts is, you know, it's around 0 0.01. Um, it's such a low number that hardly worth uh, noticing. And then here I've got the back end 300s, 400s, and uh, 500s. So um, what is it? Client error, server error, and uh, redirects, um, with 500 being red down here. So 500s are pretty low, so things are, tend to be pretty good here. And so those were kind of the, some of the key metrics that we've seen and that some of our customers have seen, uh, things that you are really good to, to keep in mind. So how do you get started with this whole process? How do you understand, how do you play around with this stuff? Well, one, you know, we, we recommend data dog. Hey, that's what we do. Um, and easiest way to get started with this stuff is, you know, go to visit the website, datadoghq.com. There's a video, two minute video, shows you everything uh, that we do. Well, two minutes worth of what we do. And, uh, and then sign up for a free trial. E pretty easy, don't need a credit card. Uh, it's 14 days. If you don't like it enough, you can continue using it for five hosts or less, and we never charge you a thing for that. But if you li really like it, which we hope you do, it's about 15 bucks per host per month. And that brings me to the end. So at this point, kind of want to open up to questions. And um, in case you're interested, you can find this deck up on uh, github.com slash datadog slash evangelism presentations. Uh, if you are not familiar with Go Present, the format might look a little bit weird. But other than that, uh, any questions based on what you've heard? And there are mics, so they want you to use the mic. So you talked about uh, uh, everything related to the uh, AWS performance matrix. Yep. Uh, what about the application performance matrix? Like, you know, if we want to capture the data of our application-specific behavior, mm -hmm. then uh, what is the interfacing that we have for Datadog, and what, like, what what can we use so that data can be pushed, the application data can be pushed out to Datadog, and we can see that in dashboard and actually. So is this a application that you're writing yourself, or is yeah. this one of the, okay. Yeah, it's our custom application, like, okay. you know. So we we've got a uh, RESTful API, um, and a bunch of libraries in all sorts of languages, uh, whether you're using uh, PHP, Go, uh, Ruby, uh, Elixir even, uh, all sorts of uh, amazing things. Um, and so, use one of those libraries uh, to instrument your application at the key points. You probably don't want to record everything because it just gets to be too much, but at least the really key moments in the application lifecycle. Um, when, uh, whatever, whatever the most important parts are, have those recorded, and those are sent up to Datadog and, and look like all the other metrics that we're collecting. And we can create a dashboard that looks at maybe AWS uh, metrics and your metrics all in the same view so you can understand that correlation. Do you have any suggestions like uh, 
or you have support for all the, so basically we are a Java shop, so we have, uh, you know, Java application. Yeah, so and, uh, um, let's see in, uh, uh, where's this gonna be? This is gonna be under the documentation. And um, so in the documentation, there's a section called, okay, super fast internet. Um, there's a section for libraries um, and uh, each one of those libraries, awesome, each one of these libraries uh, points to uh, usually, usually the GitHub location where the source is um, and most of those have really good documentation. Okay. Some of them, not so good. But uh, most of them are really awesome. Um, and uh, for many of them, they'll have also created a blog post on our site or on their site talking about how to use it. Is there one recommendation for everything? Not really. But um, uh, yeah, there's not really a, a single fine. answer for everything. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Any other uh, thoughts, questions? And again, use the mic. No? Cool. So it's uh, 5, wow, 522. I did pretty good on time. Um, at, if there's no other questions, well, thank you so much for coming. Um, again, my name is Matt Williams. I can be reached on in super fine print at mattw at datadoghq.com or on Twitter at Technovangelist. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for uh, attending. <laughs>